Welcome to Russian History Retold, Episode 180, Three Alexanders and a Nicholas in Between. Last time we discussed which path Tsar would have been able to save the Romanovs, replacing the ill-fated Nicholas II. This time I will assess the rule of the four Tsars who preceded the last Romanov, and those who I believe were to blame for the collapse of the regime. The fall of the Romanovs cannot rest on the shoulders of one person, namely Nicholas II. No matter how many faults and flaws he had, he was put into a very bad situation that, as I recounted last episode, few of the previous Russian rulers would have turned around. If you believe that Russian autocracy under the Tsars reached its apex under Catherine the Great, you would be with the majority of historians, including me. Given that, the slide begins with her son Paul, who I will deal with in the next podcast. The four czars after him should shoulder much of the blame for the decline. Of course, the blame is not equally spread amongst the three Alexanders and one Nicholas. Alexander I, of course, dealt admirably with Napoleon's invasion of Russia, and Alexander II, the great liberator, freed the serfs, was and was on the precipice of granting the country a constitutional monarchy when he was assassinated in 1881. The two I lie the majority of the blame for the fall of the Romanos are Nicholas I and his grandson Alexander III. Tsar Alexander I was elevated to the throne after the murder of his father Paul during a coup led by Count Peter Palin in 1801. The death would haunt him throughout his reign and I believe it is the reason that he faked his death and became the monk Fyodor Kuzmich. The murder was also exploited by his arch-nemesis, Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1804, Napoleon had the Duke de Angheim kidnapped and executed. Alexander was aghast as he wondered how some low-born Corsican would dare lay his hands on a hybrid, let alone have him killed. The Tsar protested, but the French leader reminded him that no one was punished for the murder of his father, and then Alexander might want to temper his complaint. This made the Tsar's hatred of Napoleon personal. This personal issue may have been why the Tsar made a number of strategic and poorly thought out decisions over the ensuing decade. Going into the alliance with Great Britain and Austria was not terribly beneficial to the Russians, but the decisions made were not for the betterment of the country, but to gain revenge on Napoleon's slights toward Alexander. When the Tsar, at the head of the Russian army at Wishaw, defeated the French, he felt that his higher moral ground was the reason for the victory. His ego led him to believe in Russian superiority. Alexander, though, was to get his comeuppance at the disastrous Battle of Austerlitz. A little while later, he was crushed again at Elau. Unlike Peter the Great, he learned nothing from his previous losses. Tens of thousands of Russians died because of his vanity. So great were the losses that Alexander's brother Constantine told him, Sire, if you don't want to make peace with France, well, give a loaded pistol to each of your soldiers and ask them to blow their brains out. You will achieve the same result as you will obtain from another and final battle, which will unfailingly open the gate of your empire to the French troops, who are experienced in combat and always victorious. The admonition from about the only person who could give it to the Tsar was what forced Alexander to meet Napoleon in the middle of the Niemen River and sign the Peace Treaty of Tilsit. It was a terrible treaty for the Russians, as it forced them to give up trade with their greatest economic partner, Great Britain. Not only that, but it weakened Russian control over Poland, something the Tsar's grandmother, Catherine, had worked so hard for. I have to go back to Alexander's egotism and his belief that by being Tsar of Russia, you were God's representative on earth. This privileged feeling was to grow and grow in the minds of the Romanovs, but not all the members, only those on top. Paul's decision to make sure that only the firstborn son would be handed the reins of the country was to bolster this feeling. It was no longer who was the best or the smartest, 
that would take control, but birth position. Alexander had made numerous early mistakes in his military decisions, but he quickly realized that if he were to defeat Napoleon, he needed to heed the advice of his able generals, and he had many very capable men under him. After the Treaty of Tilsit, the Tsar was under siege from his family, advisors, and the people of Russia. It was a humiliating deal, and it was all Alexander's fault. How could the autocrat of all of Russia sign something like it? God's chosen one was made to be subservient to a rogue Corsican, which seemed like a disgrace. It was so bad that the Tsar's advisor, Nicholas Novosiltsev, warned him that, quote, Sire, I must remind you of the fate of your father. He understood and replied by saying, Good heavens, I know, I see that, but what can I do against the destiny that is leading me? Adding to the pressure was the emperor's mother, Maria Fyodorovna. As you might have figured, she was already pissed off at her son's involvement in the murder of her husband. And she was dismissive of his decision to make a deal with the French leader. Alexander's wife Elizabeth commented on this when she said, quote, The Empress, who, as a mother, should support and defend the interests of her son from thoughtlessness, from pride, has succeeded in becoming the leader of an insurrection. All the malcontents, of whom there were a great number, rally around her, praising her to the skies, and never has she attracted so many people to Pavlovsk as this year. I cannot express to you how indignant it makes me. Over the coming years, the pressure on Alexander from all sides of Russian society continued to make his life difficult. When the French invaded on June 24, 1812, you can hear the halls echo with the phrase, I told you so. This could not have made things any easier on the Tsar. With over 600,000 foreign soldiers on Russian soil, the existence of the Romanov rulers was in peril. In my previous podcast about the invasion, I didn't make this issue quite as significant as I should have. Internally, Alexander was in trouble. Externally, the threat was equally great. How was he to handle things? Much to his credit, he relied on his generals to handle the situation, which did not make his Russian critics satisfied. Many of the generals were not native Russians like Barclay de Tolly, who Alexander had to dismiss as commander of all of the Russian troops after the invasion because of intense pressure. Luckily, General Kutuzov was available. He was Russian, and he took control. Kutuzov's scorched-earth policy, not allowing the French to live off the land as they marched deeper and deeper into Russia, was also hated by the aristocracy as they lost their estates in the west and control of the serfs that left their lands. Alexander held strong despite all of the pressure, which you have to give him lots of credits for. The Battle of Borodino, which in hindsight was a draw, although both sides claimed victory, it gave the Russians their first ray of hope. It also took a lot of pressure off the Tsar. The burning of Moscow turned the tide back of good feelings again against Alexander, but that was short-lived when Napoleon was forced to retreat. From there, everything Alexander and his generals did increased his stature, first amongst his own people, then with the rest of Europe. Then Alexander's ego began to take over his decisions, he insisted on going all the way to Paris with his troops, something that his successors were to regret. These men, mostly of the upper classes, were to see how backwards Russia was in comparison to even the poorest parts of Europe. They would begin to sow the seeds of discontent that would begin with the Decemberist Revolution in 1825 and end with the Russian Revolution of 1917. Is there any blame to be laid at the feet of Alexander I in the downward spiral of the Romanovs? Yes, but the general feeling is that, while he did have things begin their journey toward destruction, it wasn't the push that his brother would give it when Nicholas I took over in 1825. While Alexander I released the Kraken, that was the awareness of the backward state of the Russian life, 
He didn't rub it in the face of his own people. Now we move on to the reign of the arch-conservative and reactionary Nicholas I. He was to be the father, grandfather, and great-grandfather of the last three czars. I believe he was the main cause of the collapse of the Romanov dynasty. His paranoia and puzzling decisions undid all the good that will that his brother Alexander had created. Nicholas, through his short-sightedness, left Russia so backwards that not only would it lose the Crimean War, it would lack the military capabilities to win either the Russo-Japanese War or World War I, effectively sealing the fate of his namesake, Nicholas II. The Tsar's official doctrine was orthodoxy, autocracy, nationality. This was the rule of the land, and everyone had to follow the ideal. Spies were everywhere, to a level that would not be seen until the days of Joseph Stalin. It wasn't just the common people who would chafe under Nicholas's edicts. It was the nobility that would find the oppression most stifling. After the Decemberist uprising of 1825, it was apparent that the officer corps, made up primarily of the sons of the nobility, echoed the problems in the upper echelon of society. Knowing that his father Paul and his grandfather Peter III were murdered with the help of noblemen, that must have fed into Tsar's paranoia. Nicholas and his ministers were as conservative a bunch as you can imagine. They even went so far as to stop the expansion of the railroad system because it would, quote, weaken the moral fiber of Russian society. The absolute absurdity of this statement should give you a big clue as to the mindset of Nicholas. Another clue is the excerpt from his biography from Nicholas Ryazanovsky. Quote, Nicholas I's insistence on firmness and stern action was based on fear, not confidence. His determination concealed a state approaching panic, and his courage fed on something akin to despair. It is this behavior and thinking that led to the disastrous Crimean War, which showed the West how backwards Russia had become since the time of Alexander I, just a few decades before. One glaring flaw in Nicholas's personality was his behavioral militarism. Like his father and grandfather, he loved to march, drill his underlings, design uniforms, and punish his men for even the most minor infraction. This caused him to be utterly despised by those who served him. Nicholas's obsession with military discipline would make his decision-making uncompromising. It was his way or the highway, and he used his secret police to make sure that everyone in Russia, from peasant to nobleman, behaved as the Tsar wanted him to. Gone were the days when men could write openly about new ideas or life in society. In fact, the education minister, Sergei Uvarov, basically was told to keep the people stupid. He once said that, quote, If I can extend Russia's childhood another 50 years, I will consider my mission accomplished. Ignorance equaled docile behavior, according to Nicholas. But you can only put people down for so long until they boil over. Much like keeping a teenage child under wraps, they will eventually break away, sometimes violently, which happened to his son, Alexander II. Tsar Alexander II tried to reform the country and institute changes that would help move it forward, but Nicholas had put in so many roadblocks that it was all but impossible to accomplish. Alexander II would also be the only one of these four czars to be totally prepared to take the throne when he was 37. He was groomed to be the Tsar Emperor, as opposed to anyone with the possible exception of his uncle, Alexander I. But his ascension was tainted by the murder of his father, Paul. Nicholas I was not the one that was thought to become Tsar, as his brother Constantine was the chosen one. Alexander III's brother, Nicholas, also known in the family as Nixa, was to take the reign before his untimely death in the spring of 1865, due to tuberculosis, and we all know how unprepared Nicholas II was when he took the title of Tsar in 1894 
when his father died prematurely at the age of 49. Alexander II has been thought by many to be the, quote, great liberator. But we have to be real honest here, as he was a lighter shade of reactionary conservatism, instead of being a true liberal or even a moderate. As author Michael Farquhar puts in his book, Secret Lives of the Tsars, Alexander II was every bit the autocrat of his father, Nicholas I had been. He just lacked the same ferocity. Still, he did send down the edict to free the serfs and tried to liberalize parts of the Russian behemoth known as the bureaucracy. But all of this was going to be totally dismantled by his son, Alexander III. Alexander II was tasked with ending the disastrous Crimean War, which brought shame and suffering to the Russian people. With his ideas of reform and a relaxation of censorship, he allowed the seething intellectuals the ability to vent their frustration at the reign of his father. This venting, though, was to lead to seven assassination attempts on his life, with the last one, of course, being successful. His death, which was witnessed by both his son and his grandson, the future Nicholas II, an even more reactionary climate settled in on the people of Russia due to the actions of Alexander III. Instead of trying to find solutions to the woes of the people who would try to kill the Tsar and his ministers, Alexander decided to ratchet things up even more, just like his grandfather, Nicholas I. This Tsar was another in the line of unprepared men to take the throne. His brother Nicholas was the one groomed for the position, as he was firstborn, and that was the succession's designate, as directed by Tsar Paul. Instead of preparing all of the children, only the firstborn was readied. This is why I believe that the edict Paul set out, which countermanded the one put out by Peter the Great to have the reigning Tsar choose his successor, it became a cornerstone in the demise of the Romanov rule. Alexander III quickly dismantled many of the reforms that his father had begun and totally suppressed and threw out any thought of a constitutional monarchy. This was his Russia, and he was not going to share it with anyone, much less the people. This Alexander was not an intellectual by any means. He was more of a brute of a man. He was actually nicknamed the Bullock by his father, although he was much more loyal and true to his wife than his father, who had an open mistress and children he was promoting as the next heirs, had he lived. Alexander III was very devoted to his wife, Maria, a Dutch princess who was originally betrothed to his brother before his death. Under this Tsar, large-scale pogroms were initiated against the Jews, which increased their resentment towards the monarchy and led to their increased involvement with radical movements like the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. The budget? Well, it was in tatters, mainly due to the latest Russo-Turkish war. I believe this was the ninth one. To try to improve the financial situation, the ministers, with Alexander's blessing, decided to increase exports of grains to bring in much-needed cash. Unfortunately, this caused a massive famine in 1891 through 92, along with a cholera epidemic. The government actually refused to acknowledge the famine, but when confronted with the obvious needs and their lack of ability to help, they turned to the upper class for aid. And if you remember the Tolstoy uh, podcasts, he was very much, Leo Tolstoy was very much involved in this. While the educated classes like Tolstoy came out in droves to help, it really caused a very real sense of resentment by them against the government. Add to the internal problems, Alexander's leadership on foreign affairs was equally disastrous. A crisis in the Balkans led to the dissolution of the Three Emperors League, followed by the Bulgarian crisis in 1885-87, to which showed the world yet again how weak the Russians were, which would embolden their enemies in the early 20th century. What Alexander and his administrators failed to understand was that the world was modernizing and the Industrial Revolution was in full swing, whether they liked it or not. They did try to increase the pace of industrialization, and they did it to some degree towards the end of his reign, 
but it was really too little and too late. When he died at the young age of 49 in 1894, he left his totally unprepared son Nicholas with the job of bringing Russia into the 20th century, something he had no clue on how to accomplish. So that's my quick recap of the four czars before Nicholas II and the end of Romanov's. And I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Join me next time as I rethink the reign of Paul I, son of Catherine's father, and also father of Alexander I and Nicholas I. After I finish my review of Paul, I'm going to take a detour and cover a subject in depth that really needs it. The Russian Civil War. A war that would take the lives of 30 million people and forever change Russia and its neighbors. Now, since this podcast is released around the time of the holidays, I'm wishing all my listeners and hopefully you had a Merry Christmas, a Happy Holidays, Happy New Year. Well, not to the traditional Russian Orthodox people who listen. That's going to come in a little while. Being uh, the Christmas on January 7th and a week later, the uh, actual New Year's in the old calendar. So now, until the next time, до свидания и спасибо большое.